Miami Sun Coast. couple weeks we are launching a new series called Suncoast at the Movies. It is going to be such an awesome series. We do it quite often and uh, this this year we got new movies that we're going to be picking from and uh, we have a trailer just following this music but uh, yeah we have some exciting things. There's going to be some outfits and there's going to be some songs. It's going to be great. You don't want to miss it. Invite your friends and family. It's going to be awesome. You ready to sing a few more songs? Let's do it.
You 
Thank you so much for singing out with us. Enjoy the rest of the service. It's summertime once again, and that means Suncoast at the Movies is premiering soon. Join us each weekend as we explore a different story and the life lessons they teach us. Discover the ways you might be living as one of the beloved characters. Maybe your life belongs in the wonderful world of Wonka, where there are no limits to your imagination. Or maybe you're wondering how your life might look if you just did everything you wanted. Like Ferris Bueller on his day off, you'll be inspired to find ways to live your life to the fullest and be reminded that your past does not determine your future. So be like Moana and take a leap into the next epic adventure. Realize that you'll have to be brave when you face challenges, villains, and the occasional dark night of the soul. We know you love the Suncoast Band, so you'll once again get to enjoy live performances of hit songs from each movie. Plus an extra special weekend in July featuring songs from the powerful musical Les Miserables. So mark your calendars, invite your friends, and save a good seat for a cinematic summer at Suncoast. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. Let's try that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thanks for being here. It is a beautiful day outside. Uh, believe it or not, this week, the, you know that little pocket of rain that no one got? We got it right here. <laughs> I, I actually went outside. It rained here for 30 minutes solid. I went outside and stood in the rain and got the mail and just went, ugh, what is this coming from the sky? So it was a beautiful day. Thanks for the rain, God. We appreciate it so much. But uh, a lot of good things are happening. Let me tell you some of the things. After the service today, it's first of, always the first of the month we do communion down front. So if you want communion, it's down here. Second thing is, if you want to know more about Suncoast, for years we found out that people, they come to Suncoast and they want to know how to get more involved and they can't seem to break in. And sometimes it's hard with them. You go to a new place, how do I get more involved? The answer we discovered is called Suncoast Tour. So we do this about once a month or so, We're, and there's a tour next week at 10 a.m. So you can come to the 9 o'clock service, tour at 10 o'clock, and then after that, they feed you breakfast, but they put you on a big black van, a real nice high-top van. They, it's got electronics in it. They take you all around the campus. They show you what's behind the scenes at middle school. You don't want to get out. <laughs> Just to let you know, but it is a lot of fun over there. But they take you behind the scenes in children's area upstairs and let you see the, uh, the real production area. You get to hear the history of the church, see what we're doing, why we're doing what we're doing. It's really a, a, a great adventure followed up by a free breakfast. And if you want to do that, all you have to do is sign up. How do you do that? It's free. Take the cards in front of you that has a perforation in your hand. Put your name on it, Suncoast Tour either an email or a phone number, and we'll remind you, give you a note this week, remind you you're signed up for the tour. So if you want to do that, it is a fun thing to do. It lasts about from start to finish, 30, 40 minutes, and, uh, and it is a great thing. So yep. those are things that are happening. Beyond that, starting tomorrow is what? Youth camp. <laughs> youth camp. That's right. Youth, those are all the parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, we got rid of them for a week. So... On this campus, we have youth camp beginning tomorrow, and there will be 50 or 60 kids plus mm -hmm. uh, uh, some help, like one helper. <laughs> and, but I know this. I'm locking my office door. I'll only come here when necessary. But they have a zip line. They have the lake that they do things in. Anita, our, our youth pastor, and James did a great job. And our kids are involved. My, my, my kids, my grandkids are involved. Your kids are involved. Kids are but it's a great week of bonding and youth experience. So we're excited about that. I know your parents are too. So it's a good thing. So anything else? Did I miss anything? No, it's wonderful. Oh, what about At the Movies? Yeah, so in two weeks from today, we start At the Movies. You saw the trailer. This is a great time. We do this every summer because it's sort of a non-threatening way for you to invite friends, family, neighbors, coworkers to come and check out Suncoast and watch movies that are very familiar to us. And we pull out some of those biblical principles that we can apply to our everyday life. So you do not want to miss it. It's a good time to bring someone along. Good. Yep. Now let's start with reading the scripture from Matthew chapter 14. Would you read it for us? Let's go. At that time, Herod, the tet... How do I pronounce that? Tetrarch. Word? The tetrarch. Wait, wait. What is a tetrarch? That means he's not the big guy. He's kind of a sub-Herod. He's a sub-Herod, Over yes. Galilee, but not really the biggest Herod. So it's like a... A mini me of Herod. You got it? Austin Powers, <laughs> kind of like that. So, sorry. So at that time, little Herod 
<laughs> heard the reports about Jesus. And he said to his attendants, this must be John the Baptist, and he has risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they loved John, and he considered that John was a prophet. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guest and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she requested, whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said to Herod, give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. King Herod was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted. And he had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl, who carried it over to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body, and they buried it. And then they went out and told Jesus what happened. When Jesus heard what had happened to John, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed Jesus on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. That was a long passage. Thanks for reading it today. So, but as we jump in, let's, in your notes, you have some notes in front of you. Uh, we're going to look at note number one. But as you do that, we're going to look at it. Uh, life contains tragedies that we cannot avoid. This teaching today is going to be about some very practical teachings. For the last few weeks, we've been in, talking about untangling the culture from Moses to Jesus to us. Today, we're going to talk about something that will help you. And when you leave here today, there's going to be some expressions that we're going to, we're going to forbid you ever to say again, which simply means I'll hear them three times every weekend at the coffee bar. <laughs> but uh, there, and I have some banned expressions here. And really, what that, I do that tongue-in-cheek because, folks, I like to tease, and you tease me back, and that's fine. But one of the things I never like to hear is it is what it is. There's nothing theological about it. I just think it's bad grammar. So you wouldn't believe how many people say, well, you know, pastor's favorite saying, it is what it is. My wife even says it. So, but uh, there are other things that will be said today. That's right. And, uh, and we're going to get into one of those in just a minute. And something that we often say or we hear it a lot, we're going to debunk that saying. So maybe you'll think about it. At least when you say it, think of me. Because you go, well, I probably shouldn't say this, but I can't help myself which is okay. It's good. But life contains tragedies we cannot avoid. Tell us about it. Yeah, I mean, if you, the, obviously the verse I just read, read is not a very pleasant situation. John the Baptist, who's a very righteous man, a very good man, has just been killed, an innocent man. And word gets back to Jesus. Now, what had taken place was John had stood up to Herod, who is the king. And he basically told Herod, hey, look, man, you cannot just simply divorce your wife and take your brother's wife as your own. There's something immoral about that. Have you ever heard of morality or ethics? And Herod becomes furious with John to stand up to him. So he stuck him in prison. And Herod's really telling telling himself, no one can rebuke me. I'm the ruler. How dare you rebuke such a powerful man as myself? But the paradox is that Herod was also afraid of the people in which his power rested over And history tells us he was a very paranoid man. He was afraid of an uprising from the people because the very people he ruled over loved John. They believed John the Baptist was a prophet, and yet he had him killed. He had him beheaded. And and why did he have him beheaded? I mean, why? To fulfill Herodias' daughter's request. So John is in prison Herod is in a very precarious situation. He's in front of all of his guests for his birthday, and he makes an oath to this young lady who dances before him. He says, you've pleased me so much, I'm going to give you whatever you request from me. Now, she's already been influenced by her evil mother, who has told her, should a request or an oath by Herod be made, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. And that's what she asked for. So Herod is in this precarious situation. Does he keep his word and kill John the Baptist and bring his head on a platter? Or does he break his word and show that he is a weak leader, a weak ruler? Yeah. And what happened at the dinner party? Can you imagine if we had a little chafing dish up here? A little. Should have brought some kind of 
silver thing. It just had you guys worried. <laughs> what is it? What's in here? You know. <laughs> I mean, what a gruesome thing. That would kind of kill my appetite. That's right. I mean, wouldn't years? I mean, but they did it because they were tired of the insults of the man of God, the prophet of God, saying what you're doing really isn't right, and yeah. you stood up to, for what is right, and this is the result. So, uh, here's the question: We hear a story like this. Mm -hmm. What is the Bible teaching? The Bible does not say that life should not have heartaches. It doesn't teach that. The Bible does not, does not say that uh, there was a greater reason for John's death. The Bible does not say that God took him. See, here's the question from this passage. Why do bad things happen to a good person like John? That's right. Why do bad things happen to good people? Now, you say, I don't understand this story, but you do understand that sometimes we do the right thing and we get a poor result, yep. right? And I mean, some things happen. We try to justify evil in the world. And, mm -hmm. and part of this whole science in the area of, of the church, the area of theology, has a name for it. What's it called? It's called theodicy. So anytime evil or, or, or suffering happens on our planet, we get caught in this quandary. It's really a philosophical thought, so I want to present it to you this way. Many p people traditionally in Christianity believe two main things about God or the attributes of God. Number one, God is all-powerful. We call that omnipotence. That means God has the power to do anything that God wishes to do. But yet we also believe that God is what we call omnibenevolent. That means God is all-loving. So when you think about it, the question is when we, we, we witness suffering and evil and innocent people suffering on our planet, those things don't really mix well because if God is all-powerful, he could do something about evil and suffering. And if God is all-loving, then God should do something about evil and suffering in the world, but yet we live in a planet where you just have to turn on your news for five minutes and you see war, you see famine, you see death and destruction throughout the planet. So those two things are incongruent rationally. So theodicy is this philosophical and theological idea of how do we make sense of that kind of God in this kind of world? Right. How can God be all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-loving and still have evil in the world? That's right. That's, that's the quandary. And so since the Enlightenment in the 1700s, this has been a challenge. And there were a couple of major responses to it. And a lot of these responses we live in, but we don't know where they came from. So some of this stuff is not biblical, but, but it's part of our, our cultural makeup, something we've just lived with for so long, we just assume it to be true. Yeah. But, uh, but there are two responses. One was, the first response, well, actually three. One was by a guy by the name of J.L. Mackey. He's the guy that wrote, well, you know, if God's all, all powerful and all loving and evil still exist, evil's here, so therefore God must not be all powerful. Right. And he just says, I'm get willing to give up on the, the powerfulness of God. And there's another guy that came out who did not like that, so he rejected that. What was his name? So Alvin Plantinga is a, a, a man who I've met. I was, he was a hero of mine, still is. I, I respect him very much. I disagree with a lot of his, his conclusions. But Plantinga created this idea. It was called the free will defense. It's also what we call like a world-building idea. In other words, what Plantinga says is that in order for God to create the most perfect world, the best possible world that there is, God had to create creatures who had their own free will to make decisions. In other words, creatures who were not robots controlled by God from heaven or wherever God exists, but creatures who would, on their own volition, make a choice to love or reject God, make a choice to do good in the world or do evil. That would be the best of all possible worlds. So Planica called this the free will defense. In other words, if I blow somebody's head off, that is not God's fault. It is my fault through my own free will and volition. So evil exists not because God created it, but because humans enact it. And here's the, some of the things we face in the church. I'm going through some health issues, and I'm praying that God would help me through my health issues. Now, I don't know we all do that. That's right. But here's, the, here's what's bad. As I go through my health issues, I've never exercised. I've eaten only fast food my whole life. I smoke and drink to excess. And I've never done anything. But all of a sudden, now I'm, I really am out of shape. Yet, I get in a place where I'm sick and I say, God, save me. <laughs> you know, at some point, we look in the mirror and go, you know, it's not God's fault that I got here. 
it's my fault that I love strawberry shortcake. <laughs> or it's my fault that I just, I don't exercise. It's yeah. my fault that I do all these things. I mean, you know, you can look at me and tell which one of us work out. <laughs> I pray so. God takes the fat out of my Big Mac every time I eat one, man, yeah. so. Yeah, that's why I wear long sleeves, not to embarrass Troy. <laughs> so, anyway, it's, oh, is that, there's a string. Oh, that's your arm. No, that's your leg. Sorry. <laughs> But I mean, you could tell that, but when you work out and you take care of yourself, there yeah. is this possibility that, you know, you're going to reap some benefits of that and longevity. That's right. If you eat a healthy diet, all those things, if you do not have so many vices that are, that are working against you, and then you get down in life and say, well, it, you know, really it's my fault. I've had people say, you know, it's the woman I married. And, and God said, I didn't say I do. You did. <laughs> I mean, right? Or it's the man I married, or whomever you married. It's whatever it is, it's you're the one who made that choice. Oh, it's yep. so hot here. Why is it so hot in Florida? Oh, God, you know, why, what are you doing here? And God said, You moved here. I mean, it was your choice to come here, and sometimes it gets hot here. And sometimes, you know, I love the fact that well, there's a hundred tons of air conditioning in this room, don't you? And we like the fact there's air conditioning. Yep. But, we, but it's not our, sometimes we love to blame God for all the things that really is our responsibility. That's right. Free will says, I make choices. And these choices have brought me where I am today. Yes. But what happens when I make a good choice and I eat well, I exercise well, my whole life is dedicated to this, in this whole regime. And then I wake up one morning and I go to the doctor and say, you've got cancer. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. I didn't cause this. I'm the guy that should never have this. Yeah. Or, or what happens when, you know, something happens to us in those areas. This is free will defense has a place, but it has a downside too. That's right. Because sometimes there are things that happen outside our free will. That's right. And we're not responsible for that. And we go through some things. Uh, um, I'll just give you one example. I have a youth camp I did decades ago. And one of the kids came to the camp and he said, hey, I, I'm not... Uh, I'm not going to be involved. I came because my parents made me come. And I was talking to him. He said, my twin brother was struck by lightning and killed. I don't want to have anything to do with a God who would do that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm frustrated with that. And I don't, I don't, and then he went on to say, I'm mad at God. I don't like God. And besides that, I'm an atheist. But here's what the crazy thing. What really was, he was struggling with was his concept of God. That's right. Sometimes it's not God. It's our concept that needs to be changed. I guarantee you, mm -hmm. if you've been coming here a while, your concept of God has sh probably shifted a little mm -hmm. bit because we're trying to give you an enlightened concept of God. I grew up with one concept of God. He's the guy that does this. He's the, he's the guy I pray to that gives me whatever I want. He's the God that's in the, in the clouds. He's a Santa Claus God. A very, we call it a theistic. God's way up there and we're way down here. But, but when you begin to say, well, wait a minute. Maybe that concept of God is flawed. That's right. It doesn't meet every area of my life. What is a better concept? It's what we're trying to do here is give you some handles on life so you can, can live a more wholesome life to where life is more consistent, to where you can go through some circumstances. You can go through some tragedies and still yeah. understand that God loves you. So the free will defense is one of the things. We're responsible for that. That's right. What was the other one? The other one is what we call um, sort of the soul development. There are many philosophers and theologians who believe that bad things happen to us because God is testing us. God is building some sort of perseverance inside of us. He's building our character. And there's some truth to that, right? There is some truth. I mean, I was a professor for a long time, and I would give such a thing. It was called homework. Anybody ever heard of that before? Homework. Kids to go home and read. They particularly didn't like it, and I would give them exams on the things they had to read. No one ever said, yeah, it's test day. Most people were like shivering, like, oh, my, I got to write this paper. But the idea was you put someone in a testing position to challenge them so that we grow. I only believe we change when we're challenged. Speaking about working out, you go, I hate getting on the treadmill, but I know that that little short-term pain is building something greater inside of me, greater health. And so there is some truth to the idea that going through suffering, going through pain, will develop character inside of us, will build something that is beneficial. But yet, while I like that truth, the flaw of this is I don't see anything beneficial about a young child 
being molested over and over their entire life. I don't see anything that's beneficial to come from that. And that's where that truth sort of fails in certain particular situations. So that expression, that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger, is not true. That's right. I mean, there are many things that do damage to people over long term, and uh, it doesn't make you stronger. It just, it hurts your heart. And sometimes it cripples us for a long time. That's right. Uh, being in a motorcycle accident, and you'll say, well, it didn't kill me, but it made me stronger, but I'm in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. I don't think so. I and mean, there's some things that are tragedies that happen. And here's John the Baptist standing up for what he, what he stood up for, you know, which calling out immorality. And then we go to the text where Jesus, so here's the question for theodicy. Why didn't Jesus bail John out? Mm-hmm. Why didn't Jesus get there sooner? Why didn't Jesus, you know, rescue his, his cousin? They were related. That's right. I mean, you could have kept him, if you take your disciples in there, you know, they do it in the westerns. Couldn't you get him out in the easterns? I mean, couldn't that happen? Why didn't the jail doors open just miraculously? An earthquake and the doors open and, and John could get out. So I want to say that oftentimes we ask why, why, why didn't this, why didn't this? And it's really the wrong question. The real question that I would suggest that we ask is what now? What can I do now? The tragedies happen. I can't undo it. What can we do right. to, to, to see how we can make things happen after this? When the unexpected happens and the tragedy strikes, what do we do? First thing we do often is get mad at God. Mm-hmm. And then, or get mad at my concept. Sometimes we withdraw from life. But what do we do when there's a senseless tragedy? Yeah. A young girl is killed on a motorcycle or a baby dies with cancer. Mm-hmm. I mean, what do we do when a mother dies at childbirth? or a tornado, kills an entire family. And you go through and say, is it satisfactory? Say, well, it's just free will. Or that's God's plan to make the community better. The, and the analogy of, of the guy that purports his name is John Hicks, the author that does this. He says, like a tapestry. In your life, you're weaving this tapestry and all the negative things that hurts are, th- are part of the tapestry. And tapestry, they put yarn through and the backside, they tie all the knots. And we're only looking on the knot side. It doesn't make any sense. It's chaos. But someday, you're going to turn it around and go, oh, it's a beautiful picture. And I'd say to that, not true. What benefit can the loss of a child or the crippling of someone have in the overall aspect. What kind of loving God would do that to a child? A child must, whatever. That kind of, and so it right. doesn't justify that. So I reject strongly that theory. Say, you know, it's not about my soul development that all these things happen. And it's not just about the free will. But there's arguments that happen philosophically That's and right. theologically about these things. And we don't realize it, but we live within that culture. That's it. I mean, what happens when we hear the, the words, you know, I want a divorce. Or we're cutting back, and I know you're almost, you're 55 years old, but I'm sorry, but we have to let you go. Or maybe your daughter or granddaughter comes in, and she said, I, I need to tell you something. I'm pregnant. And the boy is nowhere to be found. Or they come in and hear these words. It's cancer. How do we respond when it seems like we've done all the right things and disaster still hits us? Yeah. We look for, we're looking for meaning. So let me tell you a phrase that I want to ban. You'll say it to me later. I know you will. It's okay. (laughs) Ready? It's this one. Everything happens for a reason. That's the tapestry idea. God's got this cosmic plan, and no matter what terrible things happen to children or what how many people die in the world, or what tragedy, there's this cosmic plan. And I just don't buy into the soul development of that whole thing. It's unjust. It's unfair. So I do think that there's a cause and effect. Everything happens because of something. There's always a cause and effect. That's right. But not everything happens for a specific reason. But we like that because when we don't see it, yep. we want to find some understanding. That's right. So we pull that phrase out of the sky and we say it. But at the end of the day, it creates a lot of heartache as well. Does that make sense? Yes. Anyways, so today we're trying to take your concept of God and let it grow a little bit. We're not done. We hopefully, when you leave here in a few minutes, you go, okay. I know I did believe that, I did believe that, I did believe that. Now I'm going to have to rethink some of these things. And I I tell people, if you can't buy it, just rent it a while. That's right. Just try it for a little while. Anyway, so so, um, what about Job? How does Job fit in? Yeah, so one of the best theodicies in in the Scripture is the oldest book in the Bible. It's the book, book of Job. And Job is this righteous man. He's done everything right. He's very faithful to God. He gives. 
He has a beautiful family. He has a lot of material wealth. And then one day, God strikes him down, and he loses everything. He loses all of his wealth. He loses his sons. And he's left to ask, what happened? What happened? His wife says, you should just curse God and die. That's a loving, supporting wife. <laughs> Yeah. It goes back to what you said. Job said, I do, right? God yeah, didn't say that, it before. Right. But Job's friends, his three best friends come to him, and they have this same idea that many, many of us in our culture still hold to, is that good things happen to good people. And if something bad happens to you, then you've done something wrong to upset the cosmic nature of the universe. You've done something to upset God because bad things happen when bad people make bad decisions. But yet that's not the case in Job. Job shows us that even good things happen to bad people, and sometimes bad things happen to good people. And I love what you were talking about, the tapestry and turning around and how beautiful that tapestry would be, but we have the ability as humans to make sense of tragedy after it happens. Like I'm, I'm thinking of my good friend Lisa Moore, who lost her child, Blaze, to cancer at one years old. Like that didn't happen for a reason, but she looked at that tragedy and said, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. Do I let my son's death just happen? Or do I get to give it meaning? And she starts this wonderful charity called Blaze of Hope where they help families who have children who have cancer. That is what we do in the midst of tragedy. Job reminds us to let go of this theodicy of trying to blame God or blame others or I have to be good in order for good things to happen. No, it's... Be good because God is good, and that's what I'm trying to reflect. It's harmful to try and think that everything happens for a reason. Yeah. Because when you can't find that reason, then it's almost as though life becomes meaningless. So Job is written, and the whole purpose of Job, according to uh, scholars, is it's there to correct misunderstanding a concept of God. Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people, and God's the one that orchestrates all this. And Job comes in, and the whole Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar come to him, and they say, "You know, you got to curse God and die like his wife does. You got to change your idea." And he says, "I will not change my concept of God." And here's, they needed to change their concept of God. That's right. And later at the end of the book, they do that. And here, but it, life happens. It rains on the just and the unjust. So yes. here's a better theology. We want to give you better news. Yes. I trust God regardless. What do you mean? No matter what comes up in my life, he's going to walk with me. I'm not going to blame him because that cuts me off. Sometimes the only source of hope I have during my difficulty is God, and I cut him off because I blame him for it. Yep. So God's loved me through the tragedies of my life. I had a brother that died at 39 years old, my older brother. He committed suicide. You think it hurt my heart? Did that happen? Yes, it did. When my nephew who was two years older than his dad, committed suicide the same way his dad did. You think it shook our family? To the core. It hurt us. God, why'd you do that? God did not do that. Free will. They made decisions. I mean, maybe there was a chemical imbalance. We don't know. But when my dad had a massive heart attack and died, I felt sad. Why couldn't he live longer? He's only 70 years old. And folks, 70 at my age is not very old. It's coming. I mean, it's, I'm not there, but I'll be there in a few years, like, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. <laughs> so, but what should I do when tragedy strikes physically, relationally, financially? What should I do? Let's leave to number two. Point number two. When heartache arrives, do what Jesus did. Find that solitary place. It says in verse 13, when Jesus heard what happened to his cousin, his friend, John the Baptist, he didn't get angry, he didn't blame God, didn't even blame Herod. He went to a solitary place privately and reflected on who he was. I'm sure he reflected on what had happened. And he realized that even the Son of God had to withdraw to some quiet time after hearing such tragic news. Which leads to number three. Let's see that. So we have one of these teachings that goes, Yes. we're bound by time. Uh, when, we re when you return from that quiet place of contemplation, guess what? Life will still be waiting. Life goes on. And he doesn't just stop there. Jesus comes back and he gets right back in the groove of helping people. He goes off, he spends time for reflection, meditation, prayer. 
And I will share with you guys, there's one of the things in my life that, that I've never given up on that is a foundation principle in my life. It's reflection and listening to what God has for me. Yes. Because no matter what comes up, it's that that drives me. It's the core of my existence. And I don't blame God for, the, for no matter what's happening. I realize that God wants to walk through with us in all yes. the tragedies of life and all the heartaches. In World War II, when they're in, the, in Nazi prison camps, and the, the Jews were dying and being gassed. Someone asked the question of the theologian, where was God during all that when all his people were being killed? You know what the response was? He was in the gallows. In other words, he was walking with every person as they went through their tragedy. Mm -hmm. And to, to separate us from the love of God is the least what we want to do. So I don't think everything happens for a reason, but I think we need to, when we come back from our quiet place, we can find our focus in him. That's absolutely right. The main thing is, we have to change this understanding of God as being the cause of the tragedies in our life and to realize that tragedies happen to us all. And God is there weeping alongside with us as we walk through these tough times. And that realization should awaken us to the truth that we're never alone, we're never by ourselves. And God will reveal himself sometimes through that still small voice, but also just through the pat on the back when we need it the most. Sure. Okay, will you pray with us? Let's pray, guys. Awesome, God, we just come before you in this moment, our heads bowed, and we just say thank you for walking with us through the tragedies that have happened in our life, maybe some of the trials and tribulations we're walking through, some of us right now, God, and even the ones that we have not even seen yet. God, let us awaken to the truth that you are with us in all times, at all times, in all situations, the good, the bad. So God, let your spirit be felt and known in our hearts and our minds as we walk through these tough times in life, when they come or if they come. It's in the strong name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Would you stand, please? I want to tell you a closing story. Years ago, um, my other brother, I have, you know, I had four brothers and four sisters. I lost my oldest brother and then I lost nephew, but... Uh, my other brother, six years older than me, his name was Jimmy. And we prayed for Jimmy for a long time for Suncoast. He came here and stood on this stage and thanked you for his prayers. But his leukemia and cancer was so severe that he uh, was not going to survive it. He had all the DNA transfer from my sister, all the things. But one of the things he asked for in those last years of his life, he said, I love your band. And, of course, my kids were all in it. He said, would you send me a CD? So I sent him a CD. Then he came back from the CD. He said, I want you to know at my funeral, I want them to play this song. And they did. Here's a CD. It's called Blessed Be Your Name. Listen to the words. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. When streams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, a little more difficult, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when the sun is shining down on me. When the world's all that it should be, blessed be your name. And he said, my favorite verse is this. Blessed be your name. On the road marked with suffering. And though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll send it back with praise. That was a song they played at my brother's funeral. Why? Because he got it. In the midst of the tragedy, blessed be the name of God. I'm here to remind you, no matter what you're going through today, there's someone who wants to go through it with you, and he loves you. And so do we. God bless. Thanks for coming.